Hear now our scripture reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. <clears throat> Remember that Ezekiel, prophet of Israel, he lived during the exile. He saw or witnessed, he was alive when Jerusalem was utterly demolished by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, the commander of Babylon. Israel, Jerusalem was totally leveled, totally taken over, with scores and scores and hundreds of thousands of people being killed, others being enslaved, others being taken away into exile. The temple was destroyed and leveled, and everything that they knew, everything as they knew it, was over. And so, in the middle of all of this, Ezekiel receives a vision, one of many visions he receives in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and so, listen to the word, listen for the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and, you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked. And behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them. And skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves. And bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of God that belongs to us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and pleasing in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Amen. Now descend and shake the earth, wake us into second birth. Now the quickening influence give, blow, and these dry bones shall live. Now descend and shake the earth, wake us into second birth. Now thy quickening influence give, blow, and these dry bones shall live. Methodists used to sing that. That was Charles Wesley, one of his thousands of hymns that he wrote. Ezekiel here finds himself in the most hopeless of hopeless places imaginable. God gives him a vision of this valley of dry bones. He gives him a vision of what it would have looked like if he, if he could see Jerusalem years and years after it had been taken over by Babylon. Remember, Jerusalem is up on a hill, Mount Zion. If you go there today, Jerusalem's still up on a hill. He's looking down in the valley. It may even be the same valley that Jesus talks about when he talks about hell. He talks about the valley of ben Hinnom, which is the valley where in the Old Testament the wicked kings would even sacrifice children. He sees in this valley... Bones upon bones. We're not talking one or two or three sets. We're talking hundreds, hundreds, thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands. He eventually says the whole house of Israel, which we know at this time is millions. And these aren't just any bones. They're dry bones. They're not buried bones. They're not in caskets. They're not underground and they're dry, which tells us a couple things. It tells us that they are being utterly disgraced. In the ancient world, as in today, if a, a, if a body and bones were left out, there was nothing more desecrating, nothing more dishonoring to that person and that family than that. And not only that, but they're dry, which means they've been sitting there for months and months and years and years and years. Ezekiel finds himself staring into the dark void, into the darkness of darkness, into what could only be the deepest hell on earth imaginable. In the early centuries of the church, many Christians found themselves in what could be described as hell on earth. In those first couple centuries, Christians saw other Christians being killed left and right. They saw Christians being crucified and then lit on fire. They saw Christians offered into uh, the glad gladiator arenas and fed to the wild lions and hyenas. Everyone probably has heard of the Emperor Nero who killed a lot of Christians. There is also Emperor Diocletian who killed a lot of Christians. On one occasion, he killed, I think I told you all this, he killed um, a bishop of the church called Domnius. He killed Domnius, and he killed a ton of other Christians too. Now Diocletian, had, he was the emperor of, of Rome, and he had, obviously, so much money, he built all of these palaces. And when Rachel and I were so honored and, and just had the gift of going to Europe a year ago as a kind of late graduation, wedding, present kind of thing with family, uh, we went to Croatia, and we went to this city named Split. And in this city, everyone said, the thing you have to see, you have to see, is Diocletian's palace. Diocletian's palace. Okay, good. Let's go see it. So as we're walking towards it, we're in this big city, and we're walking in the exact direction where I see this really high church spire. 
I go, that's funny. There must be a church right next to that which is palace. We get closer and closer and closer. And then the map says, that's it. And I go, that can't be it. There's a church steeple on it. <laughs> and it turns out that it's the church of St. Domnius. You see, the very man that Diocletian killed as Diocletian was trying to wipe out the Christians, as Diocletian was trying to turn the church into a literal valley of dry bones, the church in her wisdom said, you know what? We know that we will be resurrected on the last day, and so we're going to name this church after the one who this emperor killed. And we're going to plant it right on top of what his palace used to be, and then we're even going to bury, bury Domnius' bones, his dry bones, into the basement of that church as a reminder that no matter the most powerful kings on earth, no matter the most powerful rulers on earth, they have no say. They have no say on what will happen to dry bones. Only God has that say. Only God has that say. If you flip in your Bible one chapter before this, Ezekiel 36, uh, I'll read it to you. It's giving us a little uh, introduction to this dry bones situation. Uh, it says, uh, Thus says the Lord, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the towns to be inhabited, and the waste places, think about dry bones, the valley dry bones, waste places shall be rebuilt. The land that was desolate shall be tilled and instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, who, and they will say, this land was desolate, this land that was desolate, listen to this, has become like the Garden of Eden. That land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, Ezekiel 36, 35. And the waste and desolate and ruined towns are now inhabited and fortified. And then he says, or then the Lord says, thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel ask me to do this for them, to increase their population like a flock. And like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed festivals, so shall the ruined towns be filled with flocks of people. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now this is one of only less than a dozen times that the Garden of Eden is explicitly mentioned in the Bible outside of Genesis 2 and 3. God is saying to Ezekiel, this valley of dry bones is the farthest thing from the Garden of Eden you could ever imagine. Think about it. The Garden of Eden had to be up high, like on a mountain, because the rivers are flowing down, and it's full of life, the tree of life. What's the valley of dry bones? It's down low in a valley, not up high. It's dry. It doesn't have a river. And instead of the tree of life, it's a place of death. It's the most opposite as possible from the tree of life. And God's saying, I'm even going to take that place. And I'm going to make it a place of life. God asks Ezekiel, Son of man, can these dry bones live? Can these dry bones live? That's God's question for us this morning. I ask you, can these dry bones live? Can these dry bones live? Now you ask most scientists, uh, and nothing against science, but if you just think in a scientific way or this worldly way, you'd say, no way. <laughs> if you ask someone who wants to be optimistic in general and say, Thing, you, know, you know, our technology is getting better and better and, and, and medical advances, they'd still say, no. Can, can these dry bones live? But also in our lives, there are dry bones in our lives. There are dry bones in our hearts. 
in our minds, and our souls. There's dry bones in our families. There, there might be dry bones in our marriages. There might be dry, dry bones among our uh, children and siblings. There might be dry bones among our neighbors. Uh, Lord have mercy. There might be, yes, there's dry bones in the church. There's dry bones in North Carolina, in Liberty, in Julian, in this nation, in this world. There are dry bones everywhere. Ezekiel had every reason to be totally hopeless. He had every reason to be totally hopeless. I can't imagine what it would have been like 150 years plus years ago, to have seen one of the battlefields in the Civil War, to see brother on brother, to see so many dead, and to ask yourself, can these dry bones live? Can this nation make it after this? Can something come after this? The trenches of World War I, World War II, can these dry bones on September 11th, 2001, in all of that destruction, all of that rubble, for those who lived in New York City and those like us who may not live in New York but have seen all of this on TV, might have loved ones who were there looking at all this death and destruction, can these dry bones live? Can they live? Can they live? Jesus may have been asking himself that when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was tempted by the devil, and where was he tempted? In a dry place. Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of Luke, when he casts out an unclean spirit, he says, here's the King James, because this is how I remember it, the Unclean spirits, unclean spirit walketh through dry places. Remember that? The unclean spirits walketh through dry places. So if you want to be in a place where the evil one is, where the devil is, be in a dry place. Be in a dry place. Fortunately, we're in the church. And in the church, we're not in a valley. We're up on a hill, aren't we? Took, you took a couple steps to get up here. We're on a little mountain, aren't we? And we have waters, don't we? We have the waters of baptism here. We listen to the word, and as Paul says, we, Christ washes the church by water and the word. We're washed by water and the word. Remember, Paul says that. We are a place of water. We're a place not in the valley, but up on a mountain. When God is bringing these dry bones back to life, he tells us this is the house of Israel. In other words, if, if the world's going to be put together, he's going to put together his church, his people first. And then through his church, he's going to make the world new as well. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel ask me to do this for them, to increase their population like a flock. I will also let the house of Israel ask me to do this for them, to increase their population like a flock. All of us have dry bones all over our lives, all over this, you know, the church, all over the world, all over our community. But God wants to wash us by his word and by his water. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to renew us. He wants to make us new. And yet here it says he wants us to ask him. Remember Jesus says, anything you ask in my name will be given you. He, he wants us to ask. He wants us to worship in spirit and in truth and say, Lord, I have a lot of dryness in my life. Lord, there's a lot of dryness in my marriage. Lord, there's a lot of dryness in my family. Lord, there's a lot of dryness in my church. Lord, there's a lot of dryness in my neighborhood. 
Lord, unless you come and cleanse this place, it'll remain hell on earth. But if you come, I believe, I believe that you will turn this into a new Garden of Eden. And I believe you won't stop there. You will extend the branches of that garden so that all might taste and see that you are good. But he wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. And I'll end with this. Ezekiel here is called son of man, isn't he? Over and over and over. Ezekiel is one of the only ones in the Old Testament who's called son of man. But who else is called son of man? Jesus. And son of man, if you would read it in the original language in Hebrew, it's literally son of Adam. Son of Adam. Jesus is the true second Adam. Everything Adam failed to do, Jesus does. And so just as God tells Ezekiel, through you, you're going to prophesy in my name and bring these bones back and give them uh, my spirit. How much more is the true son of man, Jesus, going to be the man who's man in God, through whom God will breathe his breath of life and bring those dead bones back to life again. After all, where was Jesus crucified? On Golgotha, which means the skull. Remember that? Golgotha means the skull. And if you go there today, I've never been there. I'd love to go, but I, I've seen pictures that the side of the Golgotha still looks like a skull. In other words, he died in the very place of death. He died in the very valley of dry bones so that through him there might be new life. There might be a new garden. There might be the church so that his light might shine in a dark world. And where was he buried? The Gospel of John tells us he was buried in a garden. He was buried in a garden. You see, Jesus died. He lived his entire earthly life in the valley of, shadow, uh, valley of dry bones. He fasted 40 days in a valley of dry bones so that through his death, we might once and for all have access again to his garden. So as we have access to his garden, he wants us to be the ones to extend his love, extend his light, extend his waters to a thirsty world. Lord knows we have the thirsty world, thirsty for all kinds of things. But only his water satisfies. Amen. Only his water satisfies. Amen. And we have a world of dry bones. Son of man, can these dry bones live? Oh, Lord God, you know. Surely he knows, and, and our lives are in his hands right now. The life of our family, is, is he, he's given into, it's in his hands. And he wants to bring life into it, but he's asking us to ask for his water and his word. So friends, in this wilderness season, in this wilderness time, may we ask him. To bring his waters into our dry places. To do surgery on our hearts. I know some of us, when we have procedures, we might have a dry socket or a dry joint. I can't imagine how much that hurts. How much more would it hurt to have a dry heart? And yet God wants to do surgery on us. <laughs> divine surgery. He's the divine physician. And so may we pray this week, every day, God, pour out your waters. Pour out the waters of your spirit. How does Psalm 23 end? You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. But what's the middle of this Psalm 23? I was in the valley of the shadow of death. That sounds a lot like where Ezekiel was, but he doesn't end there. He goes from the valley of the shadow of death to then a place where he's anointed with oil, his cup runs over, and then he's in the house of God forever. 
It sounds like Psalm 23, David went from a valley that's dry to a place that is no longer dry, but saturated with God's oil, the spirit, the water of God's word. And then he's in the house of God forever. So may it be for us. And may we extend his kingdom invitation to all we meet.